This is uh, what we call Palm Sunday, where we commemorate the, uh, what they call the triumphal entry, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And I've said this before, and uh, every time we have Palm Sunday, when I was a kid, I would go to church and, uh, on Palm Sunday, and they'd give you one of these, you know. I used to think to myself that when, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, you know, that's, that's not much. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, and as a kid, I always wondered, I said, boy, what's that? But, but then I didn't realize that they, they come like this when you buy them. And uh, this is called, a, I think, a crown. And they, and they open up. Now, this one, though, because it's kind of dried out. But when, I guess when you first cut them off a tree, they'd be like all the way opened up. So I don't want to do it because I'll have palms all over the place. But they would, they would take these big old leaves like that and wave them, okay, when Jesus would come in. Now, that, now that's saying something right there, right? It's, it's all open up. <laughs> anyway, uh, that mystery in my life was solved because I couldn't understand why they would just have that little thing. <laughs> but um, we want to make sure everybody, the ladies, uh, some of the kids got together Friday and they made up little crosses out of palms. So we'll be handing them out at the end. Please be sure you get one. But we want to talk this morning about uh, Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry. Listen, it's about worship. It's about worship. But whatever we come together in the house of God like this, we worship God. We come here to worship Him. And what Palm Sunday is about is about a day of worship. They were worshiping their king. In John chapter 12, it says this, and I'm just going to be reading from verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which, was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. Now, Lazarus, last week, last Sunday evening, we talked about John chapter 11. We talked about when Lazarus was raised from the dead. And we had said that that was a setup for the things that were to come. We know that we, when we read that account, at the very end of that account, it said how many of the Jews from Jerusalem, we said that Lazarus was a very, uh, must have been a well-known person because he had a lot of people there from Jerusalem at his funeral. And you know, if you're a well-known person, you get all the, you know, a lot, a lot of folks come to your funeral. And when he was raised from the dead, and all these Jews saw Lazarus being raised from the dead, they went back to Jerusalem and they said, you know what we just saw? This guy named Jesus who'd been preaching for the last three and a half years, and healing people, and going around, and, and preaching, and teaching, and he, he called a guy out of the grave. He had been dead four days. And he came hopping out of there like there was nothing ever wrong with him. And you would think, now, if, if, if somebody... We walk into this church and said they just came back from Junta's funeral home. And somebody jumped out the casket. They would have CNN, uh, you know, uh, Fox. Uh, I mean, that would, be pretty, that, would be, that would be pretty newsworthy, wouldn't it? And you would think that those folks, when, when they went back to Jerusalem and told the leaders of the Jewish nation that, hey, this guy had raised somebody from the dead, they would have been, wow, here he is. Here's our Messiah. I mean, nobody can do that but God. Here he is. You think they would have been excited about this man who raised people from the dead. But you know what they did? They said, man, we've got to do something about this guy. Because how, how can we answer that? How can we stand up against that? How can we accuse him of being a Beelzebub when he's raising people from the dead? So instead of being willing to bow down and worship him as the Savior who he was and is, they weren't willing to give up their position of power. They weren't willing to give up their position of leadership to this guy from Nazareth. So they said, man, we've got we to do something about him. So they started a plan on how they were going to kill him. They were looking for the opportunity to liquidate him, get him out of the picture. And it set up the events of what we call the Passion Week. We had said that, that uh, the events of John chapter 11 was maybe a few weeks or maybe a few months before the Passion Week. But it brings us to chapter 12. And just so you get the idea of what's happening. We'll read verse 1 again. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. 
There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. So here we go. Now, Lazarus, we said that Lazarus was a, a follower of Jesus. He was a supporter. He had two sisters. Their names were what? Martha and Mary. Okay, we, we've read about them before. And listen to what he says. Then took Mary. Martha was doing what she did best. She was serving. She was cooking. She was slicing. She was... But Mary did what she did best. Now, whenever you read about this Mary, this Mary is not the mother of Jesus. There are a few Marys in the scriptures. But this Mary was a sister to Lazarus. And every time we read about Mary in the Bible, she's sitting at Jesus' feet. She's sitting at Jesus' feet. The first time we read about her was when Jesus came to visit them. And Martha was doing what she does. She was in the kitchen cooking, getting supper ready. And Jesus was in the other room talking and teaching. And Mary was sitting at his feet because she had a hungry, a thirsty heart to hear God's word. And she was worshiping him. And remember old Martha, remember what she said. She said, Jesus, you better tell my sister to get here and help me. And Jesus said, Martha, she's chosen the better thing. It's okay to serve, but it's much, much more better to listen. It's much more better to worship. That's the first time we see Mary. The second time we see Mary is back in John chapter 11 when she found out that Jesus came. Her brother had died. And uh, Mary ran to him and fell at his feet and said, Jesus, if you only been here, she came to him with a broken heart because she had lost her brother. But she was at his feet. But here we see a whole different Mary. Well, no, not a different Mary. <laughs> the same Mary. But a whole different setting now. Because it says that Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Mary came with a heart of worship. Jesus. And what she did, she took this perfume, this uh, Spike nard, this ointment. Where some people say that might have been as worth as much as a year's salary at that time. Very costly. Very expensive. Something that she had probably saved up, maybe worked for, maybe to get enough money to buy this. And I had also read elsewhere that it was the kind of thing that a woman would save for her, for her wedding night. It was just reserved for that very one particular special time in person. Cost a lot of money. She took it and she opened it. Now listen, there's a similar story in the other Gospels. And you can't get them mixed up. There was another story in the other Gospels where a sinner woman came. Probably a prostitute. Came into the house where Jesus was. And she, she cried on his feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And that was, that was, a, that was a, an outpouring of repentance. She repented. She came to Christ and repented. And he said, your faith has saved you. Go. And she left and she was saved. But this is a whole different story. Mary didn't have to come in repentance because she had already done that. She had already owned Jesus as her Savior. This was not repentance. This was worship. And she took the most precious thing she had in the natural. And she took her hair, which was her glory. When it comes to hair, women have it all over men. Okay. Because you know how women's hair is. Okay. It's her glory. She took her, her precious stuff, she took her glory, and she poured it out at the feet of Jesus as she worshipped him. With everything she had, outwardly and inwardly, she poured out herself in worship to the Lord. The worshiper. The one who would come and give everything. Have you ever, have you ever done that? Have you ever poured yourself out in absolute surrender to God? Giving Him everything. Giving Him everything. You know, we're pretty good at doing that Sunday morning or Wednesday night. But I mean, have you ever really worshipped Him when you were driving in the car? When ain't nobody looking? 
and might not even have any music on. Poured out everything. Everything. Jesus told the woman at the well, the Father is looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. I mean, we love to come to church and raise our hands and worship God. But I often wonder how many people are raising their hands just because it's a thing to do. They see this one, oh, I think I'll do it too. Everybody says, look at me worship. See, how many people will worship Christ when ain't nobody looking? Nobody's looking. Except him. Okay? See, sometimes, listen, you've got to be honest with yourself. Sometimes we're, we're, we're thinking about what other people are thinking about us. Come on, when we get in a group of folks. And especially when you get up in front of a group of folks. I wonder if I'm doing a good job. I wonder if they like... Okay. She did this. She poured out everything that she had. Her worldly goods, her heart, used her glory and wiped his feet. And don't you know, when you, listen, when you decide to get up to worship, I guarantee you, there's going to be somebody. Whenever you go to worship somebody, if, when you start to pour yourself out, when you start to pour yourself out, I guarantee you, there's going to be somebody that's going to look at you and say, why don't you stop that? We were talking one time, uh, we have like a leadership, a lay leadership class. And somebody had said, and I have felt this, you know, you get up in, in front of people to do something, whether it be play music or worship or do something, and you always got this thought in the back of your head, boy, somebody probably thinks I look stupid. You, know, you ever think that? Well, you know what? Let me tell you something. I guarantee you that if you get up to worship God, there's going to be somebody who's going to think you look stupid. Come on. I guarantee you. That if you get up to preach a message, somebody's going to think, man, I wish he'd sit down and shut up. He got that wrong. He said that word wrong. Why can't he learn how to read right? Somebody's going to be thinking that. I guarantee you. You know what? It's okay. Because when this woman, Mary, who was a worshiper of Jesus, got on her, got at his feet, and poured out the thing that was most precious to her, the thing that she was saving for that very special day, and took her, the, her glory, her hair, and wiped his feet, and worshipped him. Don't you know there was somebody, and guess who it was, who put his hand up and said, man, you could have took that stuff and, and sold it for 300 pence. Man, what are you wasting all that money for? Well, we know who said that, don't we? I want to tell you something. If you sit in church, and you see somebody waving their hands and worshiping God, or somebody get up here and dance, or somebody sing, and you're saying to yourself, man, I wish I, I should yeah, sit down and shut up. You ought to check your salvation. You know, you may not want to do what they're doing. That's all right, but just sit down and shut up and let them worship God. Just like Mary wanted to do. She didn't care who was looking. She didn't care who thought what. She was going to worship her, her El Elyon, her El Shaddai, the, the, the God Most High that she knew was the Messiah of Israel. She was going to get on her knees and on her face and worship Him, and she didn't care who thought anything. If you want to worship God, worship Him. I don't care who thinks anything. <laughs> Old Judah stood up and said, Man, why don't we sell this for 300 pence and give it to the poor? Yeah, right. It's sort of like them folks that tell you, well, it says in verse 6, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the bag and he bare what was put therein. Yeah, he was a solo to the poor. It's just like when I used to go to work, uh, when I used to work in the mill, there were guys who would come up and tell me, man, if I hit the lottery, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you so much money for your church. I said, yeah, right. <laughs> he wouldn't give me two dimes to rub together, you know. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm going to play the lottery. I'll get some money. I can, you know, build a church. He ain't going to build a church. That's, but usually when folks are more worried about wasting money, they're usually worried about their pockets, okay, like Judas. Anyway, okay, that was just, all right. 
Nobody here hit the mega million. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, verse 7. Listen to what Jesus said. Leave her alone. Somebody wants to get up and worship God, leave them alone. Somebody wants to get up and dance and sing and shout and run, leave them alone. It's none of your business. They're not doing it for you. They're doing it for him. She did it for him. Her, her God most high. Jesus says, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing has she kept it. She didn't know that. They had all expected Jesus to be the king of Israel. They didn't know that he was going to die. You always have the poor with you, he says. But me, you have not always. Listen, when you feel like you want to worship God, you worship him. We've got enough time in this life where we've got to struggle with the things that we've got to struggle with. But when you get in a position to worship God, lift your hands up and worship God. Don't miss the opportunity. And don't care about what anybody says or thinks. She was the worshiper. She was the true worshiper. That was getting him ready for what was to come. Now somebody says, man, this is Palm Sunday. We haven't even talked about that yet. We're getting there, all right? Now look. Look at verse 9. We see Mary, the true worshiper. Verse 9. Much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Here we have the rubberneckers. You know what rubberneckers are? When they're driving down the highway and something happens, they're, out, they're doing this. The ones who are drawn, the, the interested, oh, we heard Lazarus got raised from the dead. Let's go check it out. We'll go see. Then you come to verse 10. See, when we're done, you can figure out what kind of worshiper you are, okay? Verse 10. But the chief priests, remember them? They were the ones who were trying to figure out what they were going to do with this Jesus character. How they were going to get him off the face of the man. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also. They weren't just happy with killing Jesus. They were going to kill Lazarus too. He was the proof. They so said, you brought him back to life? Yeah, we'll take care of that. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. So we see the setup. We see what's happening. Here's Christ. Who proved himself without, beyond any kind of shadow of a doubt. That he was able to speak life into a dead man. The anointed of Israel, the Messiah. God Most High. El Elyon, El Shaddai, El, uh, Yehovah Shalom. All the names, all the names of the Old Testament God wrapped up in this one person. Now look at verse 12. Now we're coming to the palms. Okay. On the next day, people that were come to the feast because it was Passover in Jerusalem. And when it was Passover in Jerusalem, many people came from all over to celebrate the Passover. They that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, that word Hosanna means save now. And they took the palms and they began waving them. Now the, the palm, that's significant. Because... When a uh, general, say, in the Roman Empire, when a general would return from a, a successful campaign and he would march back into the city as a victor, they would take palm, they would greet him with palms. This, this, this wasn't just, you know, something that they decided to do. But that was a symbol of a, of, of, of a returning, conquering general or returning, conquering king. They were worshiping him with these palms as the king of Israel riding in on the back of a donkey, as was predicted by Zechariah. It says, And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king comes sitting on an ass's colt. Then these things understood not his disciples at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. 
So the people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead bear record. For this cause, the people also met him. For that, they had heard that he had done this miracle. So here we have the people as Jesus is riding in. And, and the other Gospels contain a lot of other details about that day. But as he was riding in, we see the people lying in the streets, waving palms, welcoming him as the king of Israel. Knowingly, understandingly. Well, welcoming him as the king of Israel. Saying, Hosanna, save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And in just a few days, these same people were going to be saying what? Crucify him. We have the, the temporary worshipers. The ones who, who will worship God as long as they think he's going to do what they think he ought to do. There's a lot of folks that come to God with their needs and with their... And that's good. He said to come with me, come to me with your needs. But when he doesn't do it the way he, we think he ought to do it, what happens? Back to square one, right? Back to the drawing board. Now listen. He says in verse uh, 19. The Pharisees... Therefore, when they saw this happening, they, and they understood what was going on, Jesus was coming in, receiving worship as the King of Israel. He wasn't, you know, if, if, any other prophet of God, if somebody would have worshipped him as the King, they would have said, no, it's not me. Remember when Paul and Silas walked, uh, went into the city of, I believe, Lystra, and they worshipped them as, uh, I think, Mercury and, uh, I forget the other god. They thought they, were, they thought they were two gods, and they had to say, no, we're not gods. Well, if, if Jesus had been a man of God and not God, he would not have allowed the people to call to say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, because those were messianic things. So he would have said, oh, you know, don't do that. But he received that. And the Pharisees, therefore, in verse 19, said among themselves, perceive ye how you prevail nothing. Behold the word. Look, they're saying, look, they're all following them now. We've got to do something about him. When they should, have been, they should have been the first ones, they should have been first in line on their knees with the palm branches welcoming him because they were the leaders of Israel. Instead, they said, we've got to do something about this guy. Let's read on a little bit more. Look at verse 20. Here we see the seekers. And there were certain Greeks among them, meaning, really meaning Greek Jews, or Jews not from Palestine. These, these weren't Gentiles necessarily. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came to Philip, which was a Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. We want to see him. They wanted to find out who this guy was. They heard all about him. Philip comes and tells Andrew, and again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And listen to what Jesus says. This is what he says. He says, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. They're going to glorify you, Jesus? You're going to be the king? You're going to get the throne? You're going to get the crown? That's not what Jesus had in mind. That's our idea of glory. But that wasn't his idea of glory. He says, Verily, verily, in verse 24, I say unto you, Except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. Jesus wants us to die. Still want to worship him? These folks worshiping him, riding in on you know on 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 the uh, on the on the donkey. They don't want to hear nothing about dying. They wanted to see the victory. They wanted to see the king. Are you willing to die? Listen, if you're not willing to die, you're not going to live. Or you'll live this life until you come to the end of it. But if you're not willing to die yourself, listen to what he says. See, here's, 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 the, here's the story of Palm Sunday. Here's what it's about. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. See, before you can do anything for God, you've got to die. Before God can use you to witness, to minister, to whatever, fill in the blank, you've got to die. You've got to die to yourself. He can't use you in your flesh. He can't use you 
with your own self-motivated agenda. He can't use you if you're looking to see what kind of big church you can get. How many, you know, if you can break the, break the tithe record for the year. Well, so I can get my name in the book. And they can say, Pastor, mm, from church of, mm, won the award. I thank God for, for our, we, we got, a couple years ago we got a new state overseer. You know what he did? He did a few things. He stopped giving out awards to churches. They used to give out awards for like, because they have like uh, giving for REAP, which is like home evangelism and world missions. And whoever gave the most, whatever church gave the most money, they got a plaque. Okay. I can remember when we first started this church, we, we wanted to, to tithe back into the, you know, back into the state. So we gave to the home evangelism thing. We didn't think anything of it. And, and, and they would have, like, a camp meeting. And we could never go to camp meeting because I had to work. But they would come back and give me these plaques. And I would say, what's that, what's that for? I said, I don't know. You want a plaque. So we got to the point where churches were, like, competing with each other to get the plaques. And this overseer said, we're done with that. Thank the Lord. Okay. You know, we want an award. We want to get noticed. We want to get the, you know, the, the blue ribbon. Now, I wish we could stop that. I wish churches, I wish pastors, pastors, I wish pastors could stop that. It's not about being recognized for, you know, it's about Christ. We need to die to ourselves. Listen to what he says. It's quiet. He says, except the grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Here it is. He that loves his life shall lose it. And he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. I was watching, uh, I'm, I'm on YouTube, you know, and there's, and I subscribe to this one lady. I don't know where she's from, but she puts on stuff on every once in a while. And she has something on there about how, you know, how, how they're like these folks trying to sell like dried food for seven years, you know. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, stock up. They, they did the same thing back at Y2K. Remember Y2K? Well, I guess they had a lot of stuff left over, so now they're trying to convince people that we're, <laughs> that we're trying to... And they got all these food supplies. And you can buy seven years' worth of dried food for $3,000, so when all this stuff happens, you can go hide in a hole somewhere and have all this food to eat and eat it. I, I guess cook. I don't know. But it's like, you know what? what? What are we concerned about that for? To live as Christ, to die is gain. We're so much worried about saving our lives down here. We're afraid of losing things that are so that we think are so important to us. Jesus said, If you love your life, he that loves his life shall lose it, but he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. That doesn't mean you're supposed to hate yourself. It means we recognize that this life we're living here for 50, 60, 70, 80, 100, however long it's going to be, Man, it just comes and goes. And you know what? It goes pretty fast. But eternity is a long time. Verse 26, listen to this. If any man serve me, you want to serve the Lord? I will serve him because I love him. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve him, him will my father honor. Where was Jesus going? He was going to the cross. Follow me to the cross. Follow me to crucifixion. Follow me to the blood. Follow me to the, the payment for your sins, for redemption. Follow me. If you want to save your life, if you want to live eternally, follow me to the cross because that's where you're going to find new life. Jesus says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. And there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it, some said that it thundered, 
Others said that it was like an angel speaking to him. But Jesus answered and said, This voice didn't come because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Hallelujah. The devil has nothing over Christ. He has nothing over you if you're willing to die to yourself. You're willing to go on living? You just want to go on living being who you are and what you are and everything? Man, that's Satan, he'll, he'll leave you alone. Go ahead. Live your life and die and go spend eternity with him in the lake of fire. But Jesus said, you've got to be willing to die. That's what Palm Sunday is about. That's what communion is about. That's what Resurrection Day is about, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's what Christianity is about. You know, I want to say this, and somebody might get mad at me, and that's all right. Christianity isn't about the Ten Commandments. You know that? I mean, that's a religious, that's, you know, okay, that's, we want to pray the, the deck is stay up here, but that's not what Christianity is about. I can't do that. I said, if, if all I ever seen was the Ten Commandments, I'd look in there, and if I'd be honest with myself, I'd say, man, I'm in trouble. I ain't never killed nobody. Never committed adultery. I haven't stole anything in a while. But when you get to that last one about coveting, oh, Lord, help me. Huh. See, see, uh, we, can, we, can, we can write all them other ones. You know, oh, yeah, I've, yeah, I haven't done that, I haven't done that. But you get to that last one, if you're honest with yourself. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, boy, I'd like, to, I'd like to have one of them. How come he has one of them? Lord, how come he has that and I don't? Nobody ever said that. Nobody ever prayed that, right? Nobody ever prayed like that. Those Ten Commandments can't save me. The only thing that can save me is the blood of Jesus. And if Jesus hadn't died on that cross, you know what? I'd be lost and on my way to hell. I don't care how good and how moral you can be. Be a good person. Give everything you got to the poor. Go ahead. Give it away. If you're not under the blood of Jesus Christ, you're on your way to a Christless hell. Nothing but the blood, brother. Nothing but the blood. That's what Palm Sunday's about. That's what we're going to be doing here is about. Maybe you want to might go ahead and uh, raise the kids up. They're going to be coming up. We're going to partake of the Lord's table. In a few minutes, I want to ask you this question before we, before we do. The Bible says, let a man examine himself and a woman. Examine yourself. Not to see if you're perfect or without fault, because if you did that, and you, we're honest with yourself, we all have faults. We all have imperfections. We all have things we're struggling with and dealing with and, and, and things, errors, mistakes we make and it's not about being perfect, you know, beyond, beyond any kind of fault. It's about knowing what it's about. It's about understanding this, Christ, this thing called Christianity. Because I'll be honest with you, I have this, I have this uh, inclination to believe that the most folks who call themselves Christians really don't understand what it's about. Because if they did, they wouldn't be acting like they're acting. If they did, Christianity wouldn't be a business. It's become a business in this country anyway. Because Christians got a lot of money. If we, if we sell them the right music, um, if we sell them the right music, if we, if we you know, write, we'll, we'll write books and we'll go ahead, buy this, do that. And, and nothing wrong with music, nothing wrong with books. Please don't misunderstand me. I love music. I like to listen to, you know, good Christian music, worship music, contemporary music. I, I think it's great. But it's become a business instead of a ministry. See, I, I, re I, really, I really believe in all my heart, and I'm saying this to be condemning, and I'm certainly not saying this out of pride, but a, a lot of people that I know that say they're Christians, they ain't living like Jesus, they ain't living like they're dead. If we're Christians, we ought to be living like we're dead to ourselves and alive to Him. I want to ask you this morning, as we prepare to partake of the Lord's table, are you willing to die to yourself? And I'm talking to believers who have been to the cross. 
After many years of following Christ, sometimes we get in like a rut. Sometimes we get kind of, you know, laid back. Are you willing? Are you willing to die to yourself? Are you willing to die to yourself? I want to ask you to stand with me as we pray.